Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you're watching these videos, you're either enrolled in my Human Anatomy and Physiology 1 course at Del Mar College, or you've stumbled across them on the internet by searching YouTube. If you're in my class, great, follow along in the notes set, I hope you learn a lot. If you're not in my class, great, I hope you learn something, I hope these videos help you understand some of the more complex processes. If you're not in my class, Please be aware that you need to learn the material the way your instructor wants you to learn it. I'm a rather simplified guy. I'm a simple man, so I explain everything under simple terms. Hopefully it helps you. Please hit like and subscribe. That helps me. It helps me deliver more videos to students. The more hits I get, the more I'm, um, I guess, motivated to keep doing these and updating them and uh, upgrading them. If you have any questions, you can look me up at blong at delmar.edu and shoot me a question and I'll be happy to try to answer them. Now, <clears throat> what we've been covering is cellular transport. There's two types of cellular transport, active transport and passive transport. We've already covered passive transport in the last video, osmosis, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and we discussed tonicity, hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic, and why they're important. What we need to discuss now is at least introducing the concept of what we call active transport. In passive transport, the cell doesn't have to burn any of its energy to make it happen. Um, and the energy that the cell burns is a molecule called ATP. For active transport, in order to move a substance, we have to burn energy, expend ATP with the cell in order to make it happen. So if you get an inner tube in an inner tube at one end of the river and you just sit there with your arms folded and your feet up, the river's gonna take you in one direction. That's passive transport. You're just moving with the flow of things. If you try to go against the stream and try to go upstream, you're gonna to have to paddle or paddle or push or get a boat motor or somehow burn energy to fight the flow of things. So usually when things are flowing from high to low concentration, we tend to have a type of passive transport, usually diffusion or facilitated diffusion or osmosis. If I need things to move against the current or against the grain, then it's going to require active transport. You're going to have to burn energy to make it happen. Now, one of the high energy compounds inside the cell, and if you're following along in my notes set, by the way, we're going to be on page 18 if you're in my class. Now, when it comes to active transport, we have to burn a molecule called ATP. And ATP, you should know the abbreviation ATP stands for this molecule, adenosine, triphosphate. Now without getting into the complex organic chemistry and you know when I was a graduate student or an undergraduate and so in higher level courses we had to be able to memorize the structure of adenosine and what it all means. Okay, Suffice it to say that adenosine is this uh, ringed molecule so uh, some rings of some carbon and some nitrogen and some hydrogen um, and some oxygen that um, can have phosphate attached to it. I'm not going to draw out the complex structure of adenosine. Suffice it to say that adenosine is a ring-shaped molecule. It's a bunch of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and some nitrogen all together. Now, if I take a molecule called phosphate, when I talk about phosphate, phosphate is not phosphorus. It is a phosphorus atom that can have some oxygens attached to it, and then one of them is going to have a negative charge. It gave off a hydrogen ion. It's actually an acid, phosphoric acid. Now, sometimes I can stick this to another carbon and stick this to a bunch of other carbons and rings and other things. So I have phosphorylated or added a phosphate to some other compound. So when I talk about phosphate, I'm really talking about PO4 minus this structure attached to something else. So if I take phosphate and I attach one of these phosphate molecules to an adenosine, I have a molecule called AMP, which would stand for adenosine monophosphate, mono meaning single. If I stick another phosphate onto this one with some chemical bonds, then I have ADP which is adenosine diphosphate. I just replaced the mono with di, di for two. 
if I stick a third phosphate in a chain here, then this would be called ATP, which would be adenosine triphosphate. So that's all that adenosine triphosphate is, is the ring-shaped molecule called adenosine with three phosphates attached. Why do we care? What's the importance of this? Well, you know, when we're going to talk about energy, we should talk about the, the, the unit called kilocalories. That's how we measure uh, energy in kilocalories in chemistry. But because this isn't a chemistry class, and many of my students have not taken chemistry yet, they're in it right now, and you may not have covered kilocalories yet, it's hard to understand the concept of kilocalories. So I like to use a monetary term. I like to use money because people can kind of understand this. So let's say that when I form this chemical bond, it requires some energy to make it happen because you have to put energy into most chemical bonds in order for them to form. If I have two molecules that whiz by each other, there is some energy that goes into forming a bond. Kind of like if you just bump into someone, say in your class or at the library while you're studying, and you form a friendship. There's a bond that forms there, but it does take some energy. It might be just a little bit. It might be someone simply walking by going, oh, hey, you're taking A&P. Who's your instructor? Oh, yeah, me too. Maybe we should study together. Y'all become friends. Or you might bump into someone. They knock your books over and say, hey, watch it, you idiot. And they walk off and you go, wow, what a jerk. And you see them again and they're like, hey, you're in my class, aren't you? And, yeah, well, you don't want to talk to them. And someone else has to say, no, they're really a nice person. They were just in a bad mood that day. You should give them a... There's more energy that goes into forming that bond. So some bonds take a little bit of energy to form between compounds. Some bonds take a lot more energy to form between compounds or between substances. So let's say certain bonds require certain amounts of energy. Now, when you break a bond between people, some energy is released. Sometimes it's not a lot. You, maybe you're dating someone and you call and say, hey, you know, I've been thinking about it and I'm not feeling it. It's not, you know, the chemistry is just not there or I'm studying a lot and I work a lot. I'm not ready for a relationship. And they go, hey, you know what? I was feeling the same thing. You know, I agree with you. Let's stay friends. And you break up and there's not a lot of energy released. You might be a little angst or whatever. Or sometimes you call someone and say, hey, I'm not feeling it. Maybe we should break up because I'm studying too much. We don't get to see each other. And they're like, ah, ah you mother, ah, 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 cuss you out and everything. You see them at work scratching your car outside the window. Or... That's an explosive release of energy from breaking a bond. Well, chemical bonds between molecules are similar. Sometimes they don't take a lot of energy to form. Sometimes you really have to force them together with a lot of energy to form those bonds. When you break them, sometimes a little bit of energy is released, and sometimes when you break bonds, they're very explosive, like TNT and ammonium nitrate and these explosive compounds and things. So, in adenosine triphosphate, each one of these chemical bonds takes a certain amount of energy to form and releases a certain amount of energy. So if I go through them, and it doesn't really work exactly like this, I'm just trying to get the concept across so that you understand what I'm talking about. Let's say it takes me 98 cents worth of energy to form that chemical bond. And when I break it, it gives me a dollar's worth of energy. I'm only going to gain a little bit of energy. Now, normally we would use kilocalories, and it doesn't exactly work like this, but the concept is similar. Let's say this bond takes 88 cents to form. And when I break it, it gives me a dollar's worth of energy. So now I've gained 12 cents. And let's say this bond takes about eight cents to form. And when I break it, it gives me a dollar's worth of energy. Now I've gained 92 cents. Well, if I were going to ask you to invest in a bank and say, for every dollar you give me, I'll give you two cents tomorrow. And bank B says, for every dollar you give me, I'll give you 12 cents tomorrow. And bank C says, for... a um, for every, um, sorry, for, well, for every dollar you give me, you'll get 92 cents in return. Which one of these banks would you invest your money in? Obviously this one. This gives you the most bang for your buck. So when it comes to these compounds, our cells actually have AMP floating around. They have ADP floating around. 
and they have ATP floating around. And these molecules are made from other chemical reactions. When my cell needs to use some energy, it's always gonna to choose to break down ATP first. It will break down this third bond. And what it releases is ADP plus what we call an inorganic phosphate, a phosphate not attached to an organic molecule. It literally breaks ATP into this. So anytime I break down ATP, I get ADP and a phosphate. Now, let's say I told you you can invest in these banks, but in this one, you can only put so much money and then you, I'm going to cap you off. Then you would go to this, and when that's capped off, then you would go to this, but it's really not going to give you enough. And in life, this is not enough energy. It's not going to provide enough kilocalories for these to really perform all the functions of life. So our cells rely on ATP as a high energy compound because when we break that last bond, it gives us the most usable energy to... Uh, perform other functions inside the cell, okay? How we make ATP, by the way, as I've talked before, our cells take a molecule called glucose plus oxygen. We run them through mitochondria inside of our cell, and it will produce 36 molecules of ATP, and then we'll get out some um, carbon dioxide and some water. So it's glucose and oxygen that's helping our mitochondria produce an overwhelming majority of the energy for our cells. Our cells then break the ATP into ADP and that will release some energy for other things to occur. So ATP is the high, high, energy, uh, high energy compound of our cells. Now, now that you know about ATP, we need ATP to perform active transport. And here's that concept. If you were standing on a hill and there's a little ditch at the bottom of the hill and it started to rain, how much energy do you have to burn for that bucket to fill up or for that pond to fill? None, that would be passive. Now, if you were standing down here and you needed to move this water up the hill to someone else, you're either gonna have to put it in buckets and carry it up the hill or design a pump and pump it up the hill. It's gonna require energy to go against the natural grain of things, so to speak. And the type of active transport we're gonna talk about are going to be two major ones. One is called the sodium potassium ion pump, or it's also called the sodium potassium ion exchange pump or the sodium potassium pump. In our cell membranes, we have a, a structure, a protein embedded in the cell membrane. It's an integral membrane protein. And What's going to happen is, if this is outside the cell and this is inside the cell, it turns out that in nature, there is a much higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than there is inside the cell. Oops, I drew my protein wrong. Sorry. I knew I did that when I first drew it. I looked funny at it. So, if I have a channel that is going to leak sodium, we can predict that because of the high concentration, sodium would diffuse into the cell. And we can do this outside to inside. The concentration of sodium is higher here than there. So, concentration wants to diffuse inside the cell. And it does because we have these leaky sodium channels all over the cell membrane and they're allowing sodium to leak. Now, the problem is for life to occur, we don't want...